right, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Tuesday. I hope your week is off to a wonderful start. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful start to the morning today because we um, have the um, honor and privilege of celebrating um, two of our trainees who are in their last year of training and will be um, sharing the work that they've done um, in their research programs in our Trainee Research Award Grand Rounds. For those that um, haven't been to the Trainee Grand Round series, uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Hong. I am the Residency Program Director and also the co-chair with Dr. Susan Vogelmeyer for the Trainee Research Award. Um, the Trainee Research Award um, celebrates the work of uh, our trainees uh, in the department um, from across our different sites uh, and professions. And it's my honor to be able to uh, celebrate and introduce um, our two trainees today, both Dr. Jeremy Bion and Dr. Ryan Remprasad. Uh, I wanna thank the selection committee, which is made up of uh, Dr. Susan Vogelmeyer, um, Dr. Dave Vinoli, um, Dr. Dan Mathalon, Dr. Andy Crystal, um, Dr. Marina Tulushams, um, and Dr. Steve Hinshaw uh, for um, having the uh, not so enviable task of uh, reviewing um, some absolutely amazing applications this year. We have uh, fantastic work that is going on in the department. And I just want to thank the selection committee um, and to really um, welcome our two speakers um, and awardees for today. Um, we are going to uh, have a program in, uh, in the way that uh, our mentors will be introducing each of the trainees. Um, the trainees will have uh, 20, um, uh, we have them on a tight schedule. Um, they will uh, have 20 minutes for their presentation and then five minutes of Q&A. Um, for the Q&A session, the mentor will facilitate the Q&A and we would encourage you to put questions into the chat. Um, feel free to put questions into the chat um, as, um, uh, as you wish and the mentor we'll select questions from the chat to ask to the trainee in the five minutes of Q&A um, in between each of the two presentations. Please welcome Dr. Cynthia Mellon to the Zoom stage. Cynthia, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So congratulations, Jeremy and Ryan on receiving this award today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Rampersod um, today. Owen Walkowitz, who couldn't be with us today, and I have been Ryan's research mentors for the past three to five years. I lose time. Um, Ryan's currently finishing his child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship here. Throughout his academic career, Ryan's consistently been involved in scientific research. He's always engaged in research, specifically in microbiology and immunology, studying infectious disease and mechanisms by which the microorganisms interact um, with their host to contribute to the disease. So a little bit background on Ryan. He graduated undergraduate from Stony Brook, um, and then he went on to do some summer, summer training at the NIH. He then went to Columbia to get his MD, PhD in, um, training. While there, he began his, um, I guess, interest in microbiology. He worked with Dr. Adam Ratner, um, where he focused actually on the role of novel lactobacillus species and the etiology of, of bacterial vaginosis, which is something that's important to people in my department, um, and the role in preterm labor that's associated with this. Um, before starting his residency here in psychiatry, he completed a short fellowship with um, Dr. Stan Prusner, where he also studied prion mediated mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases. So, although this was somewhat a, of a small offshoot from um, his microbiology, um, it really remains squarely in the realm of infectious and microorganism based approaches um, of neuropsychiatric and other diseases. For the past three years while he was completing his fellowship in child psychiatry and probably prior to that while he was still a resident, Ryan engaged with research um, with me, um, with Owen, me, and Victor Roos and the rest of our lab to study the biological mechanisms of stress and psychiatric illness. He approached us several years ago with his um, really main interest in studying the gut microbiota and depression. And he's been actively engaged in our cell aging and major depression study. And it's really been his insight and strong desire to understand how the microbiota and their metabolites contribute to psychiatric disease. And that has initiated this aspect of our study and moved it forward. 
Um, he has been um, awarded several different research awards, including the Resident Research Funding um, Award, uh, Marilyn Reed UCM Pilot Project Funding Award. He recently received the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine Pilot Award, Hellman Family Clinical Translational Research Development Award, and an Austin Riggs Award for Excellence in Psychotherapy. His research experience um, is quite unique in its scope and it provides him with a novel and distinctive perspective to psychiatric disease. And given the inadequacies of treatment for psychiatric disease and really our poor understanding of the underlying pathophysiology, Ryan's novel perspective is, I think, quite critical to move the field forward and is necessary for the development of hopefully more effective and more targeted therapeutics for psychiatric diseases. So on behalf of Owen and myself, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ryan Rampersode, who will present his work, Microbes and Mood, Elucidating Mechanisms of a Gut Microbiota Host Crosstalk in Major Depressive Disorder. Ryan. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, share screen here. Um, and, oops. So I am really excited to talk about the work we've been doing in our lab using human samples to really understand the sort of chemical vocabulary that microbes use to communicate with their hosts and how this contributes to psychiatric disease, specifically major depressive disorder. And so probably seen in the popular media, lots of articles sort of linking the gut microbiome to mental health and maybe even suggesting that modulating the gut microbiome is the key to health and happiness. Um, but what I would say is that this work is really in its infancy and we still have a lot of work to do. And our task is to take all of the amazing work that has been done in linking the gut microbiome to health, uh, to disease, health and disease, um, and to begin to ask more mechanistic questions. And that's kind of what I'll talk about today. Um, and so I take a giant step back to remind people that bacteria have been around for a long, long time, far before we ever showed up on the scene. And part of their evolutionary fitness is their ability to adapt. And they've co-evolved with all of the organisms that have come after them, including uh, humans. And you can see we occupy a very small amount of uh, a space, uh, evolutionary time here at the other end of this, the, this graph. And so the human is really a sort of amalgamation of microbial genes and human genes. And this just sort of gives you a sense of the scope where the microbial genes outnumber the human genes by several orders of magnitude. And these organisms are not just passive inhabitants of the gut or other sites uh, that they exist on, but actually confer important functions, including maturation and modulation of the immune system, developmental processes, protecting us against invading pathogens. And really important for our conversation today is their ability to actually metabolize a variety of substrates, including carbohydrates, uh, exogenous drugs, and as I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, aromatic amino acids and other phenolic compounds. And these bacterial metabolic byproducts are actually bioactive molecules. They can sort of enter the blood, circulate around, interact with host cell receptors to modulate host physiology. And so when we think about the gut microbiome and disease, what we see is that under conditions of disease, like in depression, we see changes in bacterial composition, changes in bacterial diversity. This is referred to as dysbiosis. But what's important to remember is that with those changes become disturbances in bacterial encoded functions, which ultimately alter that repertoire of circulating bioactive microbial specific molecules that are circulating in the blood. And so there have been a, several human studies thus far that have sort of uh, really highlighted the link between depression uh, and the gut microbiome, but I just highlight one here, uh, which initially looked at bacterial composition. So asking who's there and who is different between depressed versus healthy states. And what they found was that there were specific groups of bacteria, most notably here, Prevotella, that was reduced in depression compared to healthy controls. And again, while this work is really, really critical because it tells us that there is a link between the gut microbiome and depressive states and shifts in the gut microbiome, it doesn't really unfortunately it tells us about mechanism. But what was particularly interesting about this study were their fecal transplant studies in which they took stool from depressed donors and stool from healthy donors, administered this to animals whose nascent gut microbiome had been depleted with an antibiotic cocktail, and then uh, assessed depressive symptoms. And what they found was that only those animals that received depressed stool and not those receiving 
healthy stool, uh, develop depressive-like symptoms, really pointing to the fact that there are specific gut microbial components that can contribute to behavioral disturbances. But as I said already, the question still remains, what's the mechanism? Um, and so that kind of leaves us with a model um, for what might be happening. All of the bacteria that are present in the gut, this is sort of who is there, uh, can produce an array of um, metabolites uh, that serve as signals. This is sort of what are the bacteria saying that can ultimately enter the bloodstream and alter a number of pathways to contribute to, to depressive pathophysiology, including uh, modulating cytokine production, modulating the phenotypes of circulating immune cells, modulating the activity of blood-brain barrier function, and even actually directly ascending and entering the brain, interacting with host cell receptors, and modulating the phenotypes of cells within the brain, like mastocytes and microglia. And this is sort of conceptualized as a who's listening sort of part of things. And so, I sort of alluded to this, but how do we study the gut microbiome? Well, the majority of studies that I've talked about thus far have really focused here at the DNA level, and mainly have used 16S ribosomal DNA profiling to again ask the question, who's there and how is it different between depression and healthy states? Um, but the other approach that is now sort of gaining popularity and being increasingly used is this sort of shotgun metagenomics approach, where we chop up all of the genes, the DNA in the, in the stool, and ask and sequence everything to ask not only who's there, but what is it that they're saying? What are the metabolites that they could be producing. Um, but I think the other level that's really important to remember, and as I've said, the metabolites circulating the blood really are the things that are producing uh, effective change in the host. And so really being able to understand what's the microbial signature of metabolites circulating in the blood and how is it different in depressed states versus healthy controls gives us an indication of putative pathways that might be altered in MDD. Um, and so really in our approach, what we wanna do is combine both of these levels to really ask a question, not just who's different, but also how do these differences contribute to disease? And so again, I sort of reiterate that most of the studies have started here asking who is there and what's different. But in our approach, we actually wanna start here and asking what are the differences in the metabolites that are being produced? What is the difference in what the bacteria are actually saying? And so in part one, I'll talk a little bit about how we address this issue of differences in circulating microbial specific metabolites. In part two, I talk a little bit about how we'll use that information to then identify important microorganisms um, that might be contributing to changes in those microbial specific circulating metabolites. And then in part three, I talk a little bit about how we're planning to really drill down onto mechanism of action. Um, and so in order to address all of these questions, um, I embedded my study within the sort of larger cellular aging and neurobiology of depression study, uh, which recruited subjects with moderate to severe depression along with uh, matched healthy controls um, and followed those depressed subjects for eight weeks with SS, uh, of SSRI treatment and obtained blood stool MRI and also depressive ratings at each time point. Um, and I point out here our exclusion criteria, which is particularly notable among microbiome studies in that we screened out for significant medical illness and psychiatric comorbidity, screened out for concurrent medication use, and also screened out for antibiotic use in the past eight weeks. And these are all potential sources of confounding and really sort of help us um, able to be able to analyze and understand what's happening in the gut microbiome, both at baseline and also with treatment. And so, as I said, right, our first step was to really start in the blood and ask, are there microbial specific metabolites that are different between these two states. And so in order to do that, we initially started with an untargeted metabolomics analysis of a subset of our subjects and asked the question whether or not there were specific microbial metabolites discriminated between healthy controls and MDDs. Um, and on the right, you have a sort of variable of importance plot to just identify uh, the sort of top hits um, of who, which metabolites could distinguish between these two groups. And what came out was particularly interesting to us were we found these sort of phenolic, aromatic, phenyl derivatives like 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, 4-methyl catechol sulfate. We found some tryptophan metabolites being particularly important. We also found some of these dipeptides that are indicators of protein metabolism. So phenylalanyl tryptophan and leucyl phenylalanine. And so I put a box here just to denote that these metabolites are actually microbial in origin. And so their presence is a reflection of what is happening in the gut. 
And so again, just to point out, we sort of looked to see if what the differences were. And in this small subset, we found uh, several trends um, towards altered amino acid profiles. And so we see differences in the abundance of these uh, dipeptides um, that are indicators of protein metabolism, and then differences in the abundance of some of these um, phenyl derivatives. And what came out as particularly interesting for us was this one metabolite for ethyl phenyl sulfate. And this is actually a metabolite that had been previously identified in several uh, studies of autism as being related to um, the gut microbiome in that particular disease. And what people noted was that exogenous administration of 4-EPS was actually able to induce um, anxiety-like symptoms in animals. And so what we're seeing potentially is that there are some metabolites that sort of cut across disease, uh, disease entities and maybe contribute to particular types of symptoms. And this is something that we're really excited about um, sort of further exploring. Um, given that result, we also had access to a uh, untargeted metabolomics database in PTSD subjects um, and wanted to ask the question as to whether or not there were alterations in the aromatic amino acid metabolite in these, um, in these individuals. And again, what we found was that these, there were subphenylalanine derivatives, not necessarily the same ones observed in MDD, but subphenylalanine derivatives that were altered in PTSD compared to healthy controls, um, as well as changes in phenylalanine and tyrosine. Um, the other thing that came up as particularly important and interesting for us was the finding that indolpropionate, a metabolism tryptophan, a metabolite of tryptophan was actually reduced in PTSD to compared to healthy controls. And although we didn't find that in our small um, preliminary analysis of baseline MDD subjects, I will note that there have been some other groups that have looked at uh, MDDs versus healthy controls and found that in doxyl 3 sulfate, another indole metabolite of tryptophan was reduced in MDD compared to healthy controls. And we became really interested and excited in these particular molecules, partially because we know a lot about the bacterial genes that produce these metabolites and also their cellular targets. Um, so it became a system that we could sort of really um, dig into. I show here um, the kynurenine pathway that also makes trip, uh, it's also made from tryptophan. And although I won't talk about it, this is another aspect of the work that we're doing. And so using this untargeted metabolomics database, we could also ask whether or not there are metabolites that differentiated responders from non-responders. And again, we saw a very similar kind of pattern where some of these phenolic derivatives uh, and also tryptophan metabolites like 3 and doxyl sulfate was altered. Um, and again, I put sort of a red box around those to denote and to demonstrate those metabolites that are uh, microbial in origin. Um, and again, just to sort of point out, we see that there are differences between responders and non-responders in several of these phenylalanine and tyrosine aromatic amino acid derivatives. Um, the other thing that we saw that we thought was really exciting and interesting was that 3 and doxyl sulfate was also differentially abundant between responders and non-responders. And while we still don't fully understand how this altered amino acid metabolite profile contributes to antidepressant treatment response, the fact that they are different suggests unique metabolic capacities of the gut microbiome within these two states, responders versus non-responders. And that's something that we're really wanting to sort of explore and, and um, figure out and understand a little bit more. Um, and so I also mentioned that our uh, subjects were followed for eight weeks with SSRI treatment. Um, we again wanted to ask whether or not there were any specific differences in some of these amino acid metabolites. Um, and what I note here is that uh, we saw a trend towards increases in phenol sulfate, one of these uh, phenylalanine derivatives. We also observed, um, particularly interesting for us, was that indoxyl 3 sulfate was actually increased uh, with antidepressant treatment. Um, but this result was only seen responders and not in non-responders, which suggested that maybe um, antidepressant response might be modulating the gut microbiome in order to exert its effects. And this is not a totally um, you know, off the wall kind of idea. There have been uh, some animal studies that have actually shown that antidepressant treatment modulates uh, specific types of bacteria in the gut microbiome. And that this particular change is what mediates part of the antidepressant response. 
And so given that we saw that 3-endoxyl sulfate was altered by antidepressant treatment in responders, we took all of our MDD subjects and wanted to determine whether or not a change in indoles was associated with a change in symptom severity. And what we found was that um, increases in endoxyl 3 sulfate were associated with uh, greater decreases in depression severity as measured by the Hamilton reading scale. Um, this was a trend. Uh, not not um, statistically significant, but what we did find was that uh, increases in indole acetate, another related indole, um, were also associated with greater decreases in depression severity, and as well as greater decreases in measures of psychic anxiety. And so this was an indication that antidepressant treatment might actually exert its effects in part via modulation of the gut microbiome, and maybe in fact by enriching for bacterial encoded indole production pathways. Um, and I should note that you know, in some other disease states, indoles have been shown to be able to ameliorate neuroinflammation. And so their presence in this particular association is fits sort of mechanistically with our hypothesis. And so what I've shown thus far is that we've been able to use this metabolomics data to identify a particular profile of metabolites that are altered in depression, specifically these aromatic amino acid metabolites and phenolic compounds. Um, and so I bring us to this sort of uh, schematic of an integrated approach to studying the microbiome. And so what we can do is instead of starting at the stool and asking who's there, we can actually start from our metabolomics data and ask what are the specific microbial metabolite signatures that are altered in disease. Um, and in, the, in this case, we've said that, you know, we've identified indoles as being particularly important. And something that we're currently doing is actually going back to the stool, extracting all of the stool metabolites, and actually uh, developing an assay to directly measure the indoles in the stool using a color-based assay. Um, and so in this sort of second part, I'll sort of briefly talk about our plan for how we use this information uh, about metabolites to then identify important microorganisms that contribute to differential abundance of these metabolites in the blood. And so bring us back to our sort of integrated approach. We said that indoles are important. And so now, because we know what genes uh, catalyze the production of indoles in bacteria, we can actually go back to our shotgun metagenomic analysis, quantify the abundance of these indole genes. But in addition to just quantifying the amount of indole genes, we can actually identify specific microorganisms that contribute to altered abundance of blood levels of indoles. And with that information, we can actually use really classical microbiology techniques to cultivate out those microbes from the stool directly. And we've already begun to do this. We were particularly interested in lactobacillus species. And so in a subset of our subjects, we actually used a selective media to pull out those lactobacilli, I sequenced them to the species level and asked the question as to whether or not there were species level differences between MDDs and healthy controls. And although preliminary, we did find that lactobacillus gastri was found only in the healthy controls not in the MDDs. And if this holds, this actually fits with this uh, sort of emerging literature that lactobacillus gastri has antidepressant uh, and sleep promoting qualities. And so now I talk a little bit about, well, how are we going to get towards mechanism of action? And in order to do this, well, we know that indoles actually are able to trans to uh, signal to their host via activation of this aryl hydrocarbon receptor. This is a receptor that's ubiquitously expressed on lots of different cell types. It can mediate a number of different responses. Um, and we think that this really represents a critical node where signals from the gut microbiome signal through the AHR to induce changes in host physiology. And so bringing us back to this sort of integrated approach, how we intend to study this is to actually generate uh, gene knockouts of the microbes that we've actually cultivated directly out of the stool. And then using in vitro assays, study indole AHR signaling in relevant target cells, including microglia, astrocytes, and endothelial cells. But we're also going back to the stool um, to then also assess whether or not we can um, characterize the ability of those extracted stool metabolites to activate the AHR receptor. And so to do that, we're working now on an assay to directly measure uh, the ability of extracted stool metabolites to activate this receptor. And the other thing that we're doing, um, as I mentioned, sort of alluded to, is that um, 
these metabolites might actually alter immune cell populations like T cells and monocyte uh, phenotypes. And so what we're doing is actually assessing the ability of those extracted stool metabolites to alter T cells and macrophages in vitro in culture. And so overall, um, you know, this work is in its beginning stages, but uh, what I've shown is that depression is really associated with this unique signature of microbial metabolites, these phenolic compounds or aromatic amino acid metabolites. Uh, Antidepressant response is also associated, associated with the unique microbial signature of aromatic amino acid metabolites. We also demonstrate that successful uh, treatment is associated with an increase in the abundance of indole compounds and associated reductions in depressive symptoms and psychic anxiety. And this really becomes the focus of our work. Um, and we've also demonstrated that Lactobacillus gastri is potentially a unique microbial species found only in healthy controls and might have very specific health promoting benefits. And so we have lots more to do. And so we're continuing to expand to study the Lactobacillus content of the GI tract in our depressed subjects. Um, as well as changes associated with SSRI treatment. We're currently actively looking at their differences in their ability to produce indoles and activate this aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Um, with a pilot grant from the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine, we're actually now in the process of genetically manipulating the lactobacilli and creating this sort of large transposon mutagenesis library to identify lots of different potential genes that might have putative health benefits. Um, and with the Bacar Immuno X initiative, we are profiling immune cell composition differences in MDDs compared to healthy controls as well as changes associated with SSRI treatment and to link those changes in uh, immune cell phenotypes to changes in gut microbial capacity to produce indoles. And eventually we'd like to sort of go back into animal models and begin to study this a little bit more in detail. And so I've sort of breezed through this, but with that, I just wanna make sure that I thank um, my mentors, Owen and Cindy, um, who have been so, so helpful, as well as Victor Roos, who's also provided a lot of support in the rest of the PNE lab want to acknowledge um, the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine, the Lynch Lab, and Dr. Susan Lynch, who is also serving as a mentor and who is providing lots of guidance and training in terms of our shotgun metagenomics analysis and members of her lab, um, the Resident Research Training Program, and the Child Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship, and then also really acknowledge the funding sources that have allowed this work and will allow this work to continue, including pilot grants from the UCSF RAP program, pilot grants from the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine, career development award from the Bacar Immunity, you know, X initiative, as well as a pirate grant from the Marilyn Reed Lucia Endowment. Um, and with that, I will um, leave it there and then we can take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was a real tour de force there. Um, um, there's one question so far. Everybody else. Um, great. Um, send on some questions. So from Rob Daroff. Rob Daroff. Um, any postulations um, about the relevance of diet? based on this and other people's work on this topic. Yes, so diet is critically important. We know that diet can affect the gut microbiome. I didn't mention it here, but we do have food diaries that we um, have all of the participants um, fill out in order just to be able to integrate that information. Um, and so diet is critically important and we do know that we can potentially modulate the microbiome via diet, but we're still beginning to, we're still in early days of understanding how does diet link to not only changes in bacterial composition, but changes in bacterial function. And that's, I think, still an outstanding question. Um, anybody else have any other questions that they wanna ask Ryan? Um, no other questions have come through on the chat, but you can always find Ryan and ask him. Um, um, okay, here's another one uh, from Tony. Um, Tony Yang, um, any data or thoughts about how to determine who will or who will not respond to a specific SSRI? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. And I think, um, you know, gut microbiome wise, I think we're just beginning to kind of understand what are the metabolites that who to determine who is a responder and a non-responder. And I think we still have a lot of work to do in that area, but hopefully we might be able to at some point profile the stool and say, hey, you're, you're somebody who might benefit from this particular antidepressant or you may not, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay, and one um, question from Karen goldberg Bolts: Are you recommending any probiotics that are on the market? I was waiting for that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I can't recommend anything specifically, partially because, you know, these are not necessarily regulated. And part of the what I didn't talk about today and one of my interests, because I've been studying for lactobacillus for such a long time, is that um, 
it's sort of the way that probiotics are deployed now, it's sort of like a sledgehammer on a nail. Um, but in fact, it, the people don't take into account sort of the, the intricacies and the different personalities of, uh, of lactobacillus species. And so it's hard to know which ones are good and which ones are bad. And then also understanding that in the context of the individual person, right? Because specific people might respond to specific uh, uh, microbes, but they're pretty benign. And so, you know, not a bad idea. <laughs> okay. Um, one other question from David um, Villasenor. Um, is there any overlap with um, irritable, bowel, irritable bowel syndrome and depression on um, microbiome? Yeah. Um, so I don't know specifically about the sort of types of organisms. And again, that's all sometimes a little bit of a difficult thing because there is um, heterogeneity between individuals. So asking like, are the nut types of bacteria and IBD and depression the same? We really do have to ask about function. But, um, you know, a lot of this work sort of began in noting that people who had gastrointestinal diseases also had sort of comorbid depression. And so there may is there is potentially some sort of shared mechanism there. And that's really kind of what we're trying to get at. Um, um, do you have any thoughts or anybody who might want to continue in this research of how to store um, um, the stool samples for potential future research? Oh, interesting. We should, you should, you should send me an email. We can talk. <laughs> okay, on that, um, I want to thank Jeremy and Ryan for um, two outstanding talks and congratulations to both of you. Amazing research, both of you. Congratulations. Yes, a huge round of applause for both Ryan and Jeremy and also for Cindy and Mason for being incredible mentors. Um, thank you everyone for being part of the Grand Rounds today and we will see you next week.